Welcome everybody to today's webinar. I see people are joining. We had more than 200 people register. So we'll just wait a few, a minute just to let people, the attendees join. Today's webinar is funding recycling infrastructure via disposal surcharges. My name is Brenda Platt and I am your moderator for today's event. I direct the Composting for Community Initiative at the Nonprofit Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And today's webinar is sponsored by the Institute, as well as the National Recycling Coalition and Zero Waste USA. It is one in a series we are offering as part of the Recycling as Infrastructure 2 campaign. The next webinar is scheduled for March 15th and, is, and will focus on how to apply for federal funding. The National Recycling Coalition will host that webinar again. The next webinar will be February 15th and is going to focus on how to apply for federal funding. All right, so a few housekeeping items. Uh, well, actually, if you go to the next slide, Jess, um, here's our sponsors. Um, I forgot to mention Green Education US, US so um, NRC, Zero Waste USA, the Institute, and Green Education are all uh, sponsoring today's webinar. A uh, few housekeeping items on the next slide. All attendees are muted with your videos off for the whole duration of the webinar. Please use the question and answer, the Q&A function to enter your questions. Some of your questions may be answered directly in the Q&A box. Otherwise, we're gonna pose them to the, uh, your questions to the panelists um, at the end of their presentations. And yes, this webinar is being recorded and barring any technical difficulties, we will send a link to everyone who registered. And please, of course, feel free to use the chat for discussion. Um, you know, feel free to, to, to post any discussion there, but again, your questions should go in the Q&A uh, box. Okay, so let's get started and uh, meet our panelists today. We are so pleased to have five state programs represented today. Again, this webinar is about funding, recycling infrastructure via disposal surcharges. We have uh, Larry Holly with the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. We have Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Sumro with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. We have Lori Rasmus with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. Wendy Worley with the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. Marie Barnett and uh, David Folks with the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Marie will be presented presenting and Dave will join her for the Q&A se se uh, section. These state representatives will each have eight minutes to present an overview of their state's grant program and their funding mechanism, which is all v via a surcharge on waste disposal. We've asked each to talk about the impact of the grant program, sample projects funded, challenges encountered, lessons learned, tips for replication for other states. And before we hear from each of these states, I am really pleased to introduce my colleague, uh, Sophia Jones. And Sophia, if you want to um, get your slides up while I'm introducing you. I just want to say Sophia is a policy fellow here at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. She earned her BA from McGill University in Environment and Development Studies and has spent a good part of the last six months researching and documenting state and local grant programs that are funded by these waste disposal surcharges. And she has helped to write legislation that's pending in Maryland. More on that later. But Sophia is going to present an overview of her research and help set the stage for our discussion today. So Sophia, take it away. Great. Thanks, Brenda. So today I'll be giving an overview of how recycling can be funded using disposal surcharges based on my research on existing state and local government programs that do exactly this. First, I'd like to invite you to check out our recent article that gives an in-depth overview of the information that I'm presenting today. And we also have individual write-ups for each state or local policy that I've researched, which can be found in our composting rules library. Uh, the links for both will be in the chat shortly. 
So what is a waste disposal surcharge? It's usually a per ton fee added on top of the tipping fees charged for waste disposal at disposal sites like landfills and incinerators. They are a common practice throughout the US with many state and local governments using them to support general solid waste management costs. But others have utilized these surcharges to support waste reduction and diversion projects like recycling, composting, food recovery, and even other environmental initiatives. Now, this particular use of the surcharge on disposal creates a self-funding mechanism to make waste diversion more competitive than disposal. And my research covered eight state programs and two county programs that do exactly this. The data is summarized in this series of tables, and I'll just point out some highlights, but if you want to look at these in more detail, they can be found in our recent article. Again, check the link in the chat. So in these state examples, the surcharge amounts range from 50 cents per ton in Indiana to $13 per ton in Wisconsin. And they have all existed for decades now. Um, in general, waste haulers pay the surcharge at the disposal site. Minnesota is different in that the surcharge is collected directly from businesses and households uh, as a percentage of their uh, cost of their generated waste. And the surcharges all apply at landfills, uh, but in some cases they also apply to incinerators and transfer stations. So here are the surcharges for the two counties with exemplary programs, which are Alameda and Santa Clara County in California. As we see in this table, the surcharges can mobilize really significant amounts of money that can be devoted to waste diversion. Um, even Indiana with the smallest surcharge is able to collect almost $5 million annually. Um, in most of these examples, the revenue, or at least a portion of it, goes into a specialized fund, um, and the money is typically managed by the state's uh, or the government's environmental division. In terms of using the funds, most of these programs actually direct a portion of the revenue to local governments for recycling and waste diversion. Um, some also use the funds for various grant and other financial assistance programs that focus on waste reduction and diversion. And others take the funds a step further by supporting other environmental programs like land reclamation, conservation, and litter cleanups. At the county level, we still see funding for local municipal recycling programs as well as support to nonprofits and businesses and other environmental programs in the case of Alameda County. So today you'll hear directly from five states about their surcharge structure and grant programs. So here I'll just share some highlights from those who are not represented today. Uh, again, just a reminder that each of these state or county programs has an individual write-up in our rules library, so please refer to those for more information. So first in 2021, New Jersey awarded $16 million in grants to fund local recycling programs. Uh, an additional $1 million went to universities for recycling research. Minnesota awarded $18 million to support county recycling and waste diversion programs in 2021. And in 2020, Indiana's surcharge facilitated $1.8 million in grant awards, uh, which they estimated created up to 47 new jobs and increased the amount of recycled materials by 85,000 tons. And now local programs have also had great success with similar waste diversion grant models. For example, Santa Clara County in California awarded $250,000 to launch a food recovery program in 2021. They also support an ongoing composting training program with the UC Cooperative Extension. And Alameda County's Waste Prevention Grants awarded over $580,000 in 2021, 
to local nonprofits and businesses, in addition to $5 million for municipal recycling programs. And this flyer that you see here uh, was shared by our colleague Dan Knapp at Urban Ore, who has some great historical knowledge on waste diversion in Alameda County. Again, if you want more of that information, we have it included in our write-up in the rules library. So these are all great examples of how surcharge revenue can be used to make an impact on waste diversion, as well as build recycling infrastructure and support local economies. So from this research, we have extracted some key lessons learned and best practices. The first of which is that incentivizing waste diversion encourages that transition from disposal habits toward habits that prioritize reduction and diversion. Second, ensuring that the funding and resulting waste diversion efforts actually benefit local communities. Uh, this ensures access to alternative waste management resources and education. Third, ensuring that grants are accessible to smaller community scale projects uh, can help to ensure a distributed investment in waste diversion infrastructure and support. And this can include things like wide eligibility for grant applicants, a streamlined application process, and providing equitable priority factors. It also became clear that having a designated fund for the surcharge revenue ensures the commitment of those funds to recycling and diversion. It's also essential that this fund is protected and managed responsibly to avoid any unnecessary diversion. Uh, you may hear more about this from Pennsylvania or North Carolina today. Um, and lastly, education is crucial um, just to ensure that the public is aware of the surcharge of opportunities for financial assistance and options for waste diversion. So again, check out our rules library and recent article to learn more. That's all from me. And now you get to hear from the state agency reps themselves. Thanks, Sophia. Um, and reminder to participants, if you uh, have questions, put them in the Q&A uh, panel box, and uh, but keep the chat going. Um, all right, so at this point, let me introduce our uh, introduce the uh, panel of state representatives, which I did at the beginning, but we're going to start with um, Larry Holly And Jess, if you um, bring up um, the slides we prepared for Larry with some of the questions we asked him. But let me introduce Larry. Larry Holly has been with the Pennsylvania Department of um, Environmental Protection since 1988. And the last 24 years of that, it has been in his current position as the manager of the Division of Waste Minimization and Planning, where he is responsible for managing and administering Pennsylvania's recycling, waste planning, and recycling market programs with an annual budget of 43 million. So Larry, take it away. The mic is yours. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share my story and share the Commonwealth story with many people. The first thing I want to say is I, I'm happy to talk to anyone about future, future conversations about our recycling program. Today, I want to give you a quick, fast background, but I won't be able to get to everything, but I hope to hear from some of you. So I'll start off right away with the first slide and give you an overview of our fees. There's a total of $7.25 fees on every ton of municipal waste disposed of a recycling facility, um, land, municipal waste landfill, or processed at a resource recovery facility. One of the challenges in Pennsylvania is there's different rules associated with the collection of the fees. And I'll go through those really quick for you. There's a statutory minimum of $1 per ton for host fees in the Commonwealth. Many host municipalities have negotiated that fee up. We are not actively involved in the enforcement of that fee beyond the $1 a ton that's required by statute. The $2 a ton recycling fee was initiated in 1988. That's the fund I'm directly responsible for administering and managing. It yields about $43 million a year. The environmental stewardship fee of 25 cents was in 1999. It was a fee that was previously set up in an environmental trust to manage the cost of closure of our municipal waste landfills. That was since replaced by bonding requirements for the individual facilities. And that money is allowed to be used by the host 
county and facility and municipality to do environmental projects that are covered under the growing greener legislation. Fast forward in the two, early 2000s, the $4 a ton disposal fee was passed and it's for growing greener projects, which are completely outside of the purview of the recycling statute. And I'll give an overview of what those are for. I would say right now, just remember that setting up the same parameters to collect your fee will make it a lot easier on you in the future. Go to the next slide, please. Growing greener grants. I'm not gonna give a lot of detail on this grant program. I will go into the detail on the recycling print as that's the primary focus of our conversations today. The big distinct difference between these two grant areas are flexibility and specific rules. Growing greener is predicated on having maximum flexibility to operate with under the confines of the statute, which means if it's mentioned in the statute and it supports you know, watershed protection, you know, abandoned mine reclamation, uh, abandoned oil and gas well plugging projects, you can do it under Growing Greener. However, in the recycling program, these grants are specifically authorized by statute, and I'll go into detail about those. The other thing between the different grant programs is specific competition is required in some of them and others are not. So Growing Greener allows for planning grants, watershed protection, healthy water initiative, state and regional partnership educational efforts, Chesapeake Bay protection, and environmental justice. Those are some of the priorities that are outlined in the program. But I think you want to hear more about the recycling programs that are authorized in statute. Specifically, we have a 901 grant program that requires that allows counties to be reimbursed for their county planning activities, which means they need to assure 10 years of waste disposal capacity for their county. This is typically done every 10 years. It also allows for feasibility of, you know, studying, you know, a re-implementation of a new organics collection, a new resource recovery facility. There's no hard cost in that program, but we budget about $1.5 million a year to support that program. Next, I'll go to our recycling or 902 grant programs, which are recycling implementation grant program, which we spend somewhere around 20 to $25 million a year. It's for recycling education, trucks, the cost of managing, I'm sorry, building a MRF, um, educational materials, and it's available to counties and municipalities. County recycling coordinator, we pay up to 903 grants. We pay up to 50% of the approved cost for each county in the Commonwealth, 67 of them, to employ a county recycling coordinator. These grants range from a high of about 60 million, six, I'm sorry, $60,000, which is half of $120,000 salary for some counties, down to 15,000 to 10,000 for part-time county recycling coordinators. Currently, we have 57 of the 67 counties that pursue, a, that employ a county recycling coordinator. Section 90 Pro Recycling Performance Grants, those grants are geared specifically to reward communities for the recycling efforts. It's based on total tons recycled, waste generated, and waste diverted. The formula changed regularly. The highest awards are typically is to Philadelphia because they recycle the most and they have been up to about $2.1 million and the low end of our grants for counties and municipalities would be as low as two to $3,000. Any municipality or county that recycles in the Commonwealth is entitled to apply for a performance grant of the approximately 2,500 we have. We regularly get 750 to 800 applications. We encourage all to apply, but some choose not to apply. The important thing about the, stat the statute is we are required by statute to spend 70% of the revenue on those four grant programs. The next 30% can be spent up on spent on market development, feasibility studies, public education, demonstration projects, and technical assistance. That's where we fund things like our food waste infrastructure grant programs that were used to support, you know, food uh, food feeding stations you know, food kitchens during the pandemic. We hope to re reinstitute that program, not at the same level, but in the next year. That, during the pandemic, we spent uh, $9.6 million to fund 145 projects in the Commonwealth to help increase the amount of food that could be distributed to feed those in need. We also fund our 
funded in the past, our compo infrastructure grants and our market development infrastructure grants, which were grants to private entities that we no longer do. And I'll discuss some of those challenges later. We are only allowed to spend up to 3% annually on the cost administration, administration of the program. So that's kind of an overview of the recycling grant programs. I want to get really quickly to the challenges associated with the fee and you know, give, give some tips. The first I would say is recognize the revenues go up and down based on efficacy of your program. We, you know, one of the things that's interesting about my job is my job is to eliminate my revenue source by decreasing the amount of waste that goes to landfills and resource recovery facilities. It seems a little bit counterproductive, but that's the job. In Pennsylvania, fees are passed on to consumer, which is specifically authorized in our law. The thing you need to know is the industry will not pass those fees on directly. You know, some people pay and had an increase in their amount of bills when growing greener, the $4 a ton fee came online. Others had no increase. So it's, it's up to industry in Pennsylvania to pass it on how they want. It's authorized, it shows up in all the bills as the $2 a ton fee, the quarter fee, and the $4 fee, but that base rate is up to the discretion of those private sector partners. The, the other thing I would say in Pennsylvania that was different was we have the Growing Greener Grant Program that's not related to funding the recycling infrastructure, specifically for other watershed protection and asset mine drainage programs that occur. The waste industry was not necessarily and continues not necessarily to be pleased with that. The recycling fee was okay. Um, we had a sunset date for the recycling fee that after year and year out of debating was eliminated and you know we continue to implement, implement that program. Growing Greener does not have a sunset date and was passed in perpetuity and continues to be $4.25 forever. The other tip I would say with regards to um, grants, you know, I've heard some want to give grants to private sector businesses. The one thing I will say with Pennsylvania, our public pri private partnership grant programs were eliminated in 1996 because, you know, some local governments chose to do business to do business and share their grant proceeds with specific businesses and it created competitive concerns amongst the private sector and therefore those programs were eliminated. Um, other tips I would give with regards to managing the fund is to protect the fund and institute some type of protective language in the fund that says this, if funds are gonna be transferred out, this is the process that you need to use, that there's a, main, a maintenance of certain level of spending and there's required activities. Things to look out for is the speed, the, your bill, the speed, you can distribute the funding with. In Pennsylvania, we had problems with the process of getting money out the door, slowed down and resulted in a big balance. And that's how the initial Growing Greener took place. You know, there was a, a mindset that we didn't need it. And there was over a five-year period, there was 110 million transferred out to Growing Greener. So that's one thing I would say. That other transfers for other environmental programs included litter, forest lands, beautification, general fund support, entire cleanup. We haven't, uh, we haven't overcome that, but we're now seeing revenues come back from the general fund to support the recycling program. The last thing I would say is as a tip, consider your staffing needs. The division that collects our fees requires 13 people to successfully collect those fees. My division, which administers the Commonwealth's recycling programs and manages the fund, consist of 12 people in my office and eight people in the field office to implement the programs, manage the grants. Uh, question that you need to ask yourself is, how do I ensure the fund is closely examined? You know, do you want a sunset date? We found out really quickly that that sunset date was creating more work for us and we were spending extreme amounts of staff time justifying the existence of the program. So you might want, you might not want to have a sunset date, but there are reasons to consider it. Uh, CPI considerations. Understand that the $2 in 1988 now equates to about 90 cents. So we don't have a CPI in our fund and that creates problems as our ability to fund projects. 
Just for example, the cost of four recycling trucks in 1988 converts into the ability to buy one today. That's a general example we like to give. Un and understand that the industry, this is a reiteration of a previous comment, the industry can pick and choose who's, who gets higher and lower fees. And that has a tendency to upset people. When Growing Greener passed initially and the fee was imposed, resource recovery facilities weren't covered, aren't covered by that fee. However, some people whose waste goes to, who went to resource recovery facilities saw an increase in their bill. There's no direct correlation, it's just how it works. Lastly, real quick, I think I'm nearing the end. I would say, make sure that you look at the metrics for the effectiveness of your program. And I always like to say, when I have a big audience, recycling rates are not valid metrics for the recycling program. They're valid for specific industries and specific products. But if you're, me if you're measuring the effectiveness of a state program, you need to look, I would advise you to strongly look at the economic benefits of your program and the environmental pro benefits of your program. We look at jobs, tax dollars, and we look at greenhouse gas reductions and waste diverted and energy savings. I know that was a speed update, but I wanted to be mindful of the eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Wow, that was you covered quite a bit there. Hopefully we'll dive into some of those great tips that you you shared in the Q&A. So let me let's go to our next speaker, which is Jennifer um, Sumro with who has served as the waste reduction and diversion coordinator for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources since 2016. And prior to joining that department, she worked as a recycling specialist for 17 years at the county level. She also serves on the board of directors for the Associated Recyclers of Wisconsin and the Product Stewardship Institute. The mic is yours, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Brenda. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, we'll go ahead to the next slide. Um, so I want to give a bit of background on Wisconsin's recycling law because that has actually been in place um, longer than our waste disposal surcharge. So we have had a recycling law in Wisconsin since 1990, so over 30 years. Um, our law did establish a waste and materials management policy for Wisconsin. So we do have established the waste management hierarchy for overall waste management in the state. Our law also included the banning from landfilling or incineration certain materials, which I'll touch on in a moment. It also established local government units as the entities which would implement our state recycling law. Um, also with that original law was the establishment of funding um, to local governments so that they could help comply with the state recycling law. Next slide, please. Um, so I mentioned our law included landfill and incineration bans. So the column on the left reflects um, materials that would be commonly accepted in a curbside recycling program, or if it's a rural area, perhaps they have drop off. Um, so the items specifically banned from landfill disposal here include newspaper, cardboard, magazines, and office paper, and then containers made of steel or aluminum, glass, and plastic, specifically ones and twos. Our law also includes a number of other materials that are banned from landfill disposal, um, which are delineated on the right. Um, so we do have a rather comprehensive um, landfill bans in Wisconsin. Next slide, please. Um, so again, local governments in Wisconsin play a critical role in the implementation of our state recycling law. And we have a designated name for those folks, which is responsible units or RUs. They are responsible for the management of the recycling program. So every single community in the state of Wisconsin is a part of an RU um, that could be at the municipal level. So a city, town, or village could be an RU, or we do have some counties that have taken on that responsibility, or it could be um, a combination of several cities or towns that have joined together as a multi-member RU. Uh, tribal units are also eligible. So all told, we have over 1,000 responsible units in the state of Wisconsin. Um, the law established various duties for RUs, which included passing a recycling ordinance, which um, includes information that's in the recycling law related to the landfill ban materials. They also are um, required to ensure compliance with the recycling program, and that includes having something we call a compliance assurance plan, which outlines specific items they will do in the event of compliance issues. 
Um, again, they also have to provide that actual recycling service in the form of curbside or drop off to residents, which we define in the state as single family and up to two to four unit properties. Um, they're also obliged to provide education and outreach to residents and businesses, and they submit an annual report to us so we get uh, data on their program. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the original recycling law included a recycling grant program, and the idea was that we would offset some of the costs of implementing the recycling program. So all of the items that were listed on the last slide that have costs associated with them, the grant is intended to help offset those. So in Wisconsin, only those government entities are eligible, so not businesses or, or other um, institutions. Um, again, it is only for residential recycling programs, so that a single family and up to four units. It includes recycling as defined by the list that was on the left-hand side of the landfill band items, as well as yard waste. Um, so those are eligible materials. And it's um, for any reasonable or necessary cost for planning and operating their effective recycling program. Um, some examples of eligible costs include education and outreach materials, the actual collection and transportation of recycling and processing, um, salaries, wages, and benefits. So both for the RUs in administering the program or if they also do the collection of recyclables themselves, that's an eligible expense. Uh, utility services, contracted services. So again, if you're a community that doesn't pick up recycling on your own, but you contract out for that, that's an eligible expense. Um, rents and leases, as well as depreciation on capitalized equipment and facilities. So I know this is a webinar about funding recycling infrastructure. Um, so I think our grant program sort of fits into that, that uh, guys, but um, we allow for the depreciated amount to be included each year uh, because this is an annual grant program. So we don't fund the you know, purchase outright, but as a depreciation schedule. Um, and again, ineligible costs, I think I've covered already. Uh, next slide, please. So the funding source for our recycling grant program is a tipping fee surcharge. Um, presently, our recycling grant program is 20 million per year, but as you can see by the table on the right of this slide, um, the grant award amount has not always been $20 million. It has um, increased and decreased over time. And again, as you can see, we've had this program in effect since 1992. Um, you'll also notice by the table that the amount of a community's eligible recycling expenses that the grant is covering has definitely gone down over time. Um, in the beginning, about 50% of a community's recycling costs as a result of the law were covered by the grant, and that has decreased to about 14% as of 2020. Um, the municipal solid waste tipping fee surcharge in Wisconsin, as Sophia noted, is presently $13 a ton, um, technically 12.997. Of that $13, $7 per ton is what we designate a recycling fee. Uh, the recycling fee generates around 37 to $40 million per year, and it is deposited in the environmental management account. Um, we do have a legislative fiscal bureau information paper that goes into our recycling grant program in even more detail, um, which is live linked on this slide, and um, you can certainly check that out. Next slide, please. So again, because we have um, a rather significant uh, tipping fee surcharge in Wisconsin, what, is, what else are we um, collecting for besides that $7 recycling fee? Um, there's also different uh, amounts here, as you can see on the slide, which go into um, environmental repair, groundwater, well compensation. Um, we also have a separate account, uh, a non-point account, which looks at um, agricultural and urban runoff. Um, and then there is various administration um, fees and our sitting board account, um, all of which adds up to uh, the $13 per ton that I mentioned earlier. Um, similarly to our grant program, we also have a uh, like 40 page paper, which gets into a lot more details on our environmental management account. And there is a link here um, to uh, get more information on that on the lower left. Um, I think that was also a quick overview. Um, didn't get into quite as much detail as Larry, but um, hopefully that was uh, a good overview. A few considerations um, for another state looking to replicate this program. 
um, again, in Wisconsin, our eligible recipients are only municipalities. So um, we do have businesses sometimes that are seeking funding. We do not have any program that's eligible for them in Wisconsin. Um, who the surcharge applies to. In Wisconsin, it only applies to MSW site subtitle D landfills. It does not apply to C&D landfills. Um, in Wisconsin, several C&D landfills do not have scales. So there would be a challenge in trying to collect a per ton revenue source, obviously, without a weight measurement. Um, considering whether your grant is competitive versus non-competitive. In Wisconsin, this is not a competitive grant program. So every single RU, again, each of those thousand plus are eligible to receive a portion of our grant pie. So some of those slices are pretty small, less than $500. And um, I think the overall point too, if you're successful at waste diversion, which is preferred over recycling, your revenue source has the potential to decline you know, with a waste surcharge. So. Um, again, thank you so much for having me and I'm um, happy to take questions at the end. Thanks, Jennifer. So much to consider already. So let's move on. I'm going to move on to Lori Rasmus, who's a program planner three uh, in the financial and business assistance section of the Land Quality Bureau in the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. And for the past two years, Lori has served as lead programmer for the Iowa Solid Waste Comprehensive Planning and Environmental Management System programs. And previously, Lori, like Jennifer, worked at the local county level. So Lori, welcome. The mic is yours. Well, thank you very much, Brenda. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. We'll go ahead and advance to the next slide. And I'll begin with Iowa is divided into solid waste planning areas, covering every city and every county under local agreements. And each planning area is responsible for pursuing the state's waste reduction goals and managing the waste that's generated within, within it. And this is known as waste flow control. We'll go on to the next slide if we could. So for every ton of municipal solid waste that's landfilled, a tonnage fee is collected locally at the landfill or the transfer station. A portion of the fee is retained for local environmental efforts and the rest is remitted to the state. Tonnage fees are determined by a calculation that, that calculates diversion um, for each solid waste planning area. The fee rate and the diversion rate push in opposite directions, so planning areas with higher diversion rates are rewarded with reduced fees. Next slide, please. Iowa uses a diversion rate calculation because actual diversion is not tracked. The calculation is actually a waste disposal comparison between a base year, which is 1988 for most planning areas, and the current year factoring in changes for population, employment, and economic indicators. Next slide, please. Over the past six years, the tonnage fee amounts remitted to the states have actually been increasing from about $6 million to $8 million. This increase is largely because of a sharp rise in the amount of waste that is re received from other states. Fees remitted to the state are placed in the solid waste account of the Groundwater Protection Fund. Next slide, please. These fees are then distributed per Iowa code. Some categories receive a share from each ton, while others receive an annual set amount. The next slides will highlight the programs that are within the financial and business assistance section of the Iowa DNR. Let's go ahead to the next slide. First, the pollution prevention program works with businesses and industries to reduce energy and to reduce waste at the source before it hits the end of the pipe or stack or reaches the dumpster. Among the program's non-regulatory confidential services is an internship program. The table in this slide shows measured impacts made by facilities based on the recommendations of their assigned interns. Next slide, please. Next, the Iowa Waste Exchange is a confidential service that finds matches for unwanted materials, everything from teddy bears to industrial sludge. Tonnage fees for the program are devoted to contracting five exchange representatives across the state. As an example, in May, after a train derailment, the cleanup crew was matched with the company that, that makes biodiesel allowing for the reuse of 40,000 gallons of hydrochloric acid and 6,000 gallons of fuel. Next slide, please. 
Largely because of tonnage fees, a network of regional collection centers has been developed, collecting hazardous materials at 28 main facilities and 44 satellites. Some facilities rely on contracted services, while others process much of the material in-house by demanufacturing appliances and electronics, bulking liquids, mixing paints, and offering an exchange of household products. Funds are used for grants and for reimbursing programs. Next slide, please. The Derelict Building Program is a grant program aimed at Iowa's smaller towns, and we have a lot of them, to address neglected structures. As an example, in a deconstruction project, Mediapolis diverted 98% of the material. All of the metal was recycled, the wood was mulched for a local tree farm, and the concrete was crushed and used for road covering. Next slide, please. Next, the Environmental Management System, or EMS program. This is a voluntary program that gives credit for environmental efforts that are not necessarily reflected in the planning area's diversion rate calculation. As a financial incentive, participating areas are ass assessed a reduced tonnage fee and are eligible for a dedicated pool of grant funds. Let's go to the next slide. EMS is a continuous improvement program. Participants not only work to reduce waste, but they also direct their efforts in water quality improvement, greenhouse gas reduction, and environmental education. Based on local environmental impacts, participants actively pursue objectives and targets in each of the six environmental component areas that are listed on the left. The next slide shows that projects that were completed in water quality include everything from litter removal from stream banks to constructing wetlands to installing a denitrifying bioreactor with a wood chip filter. The next slide, greenhouse gas reduction, projects range from installing solar energy, constructing a landfill gas to energy facility, and giving away a thousand trees in response to a destructive deratio storm. Next slide, please. The Solid Waste Alternatives Program is a financial assistance program for waste diversion projects. As an example, the City of West Liberty was awarded a $10,000 forgivable loan and $625,000 in no interest and low interest loans. Along with their $200,000 in matching funds, they rolled out a curbside single stream recycling program complete with an automated collection truck, curbside toters, a storage building, conveyor and baler, and a semi-trailer. Over the program's 33-year history, more than 4 million tons have been diverted. That's as counted during the reporting periods for the 900 plus awards. Next slide, please. SWAP also funds timely initiatives, such as the food storage grants that were offered in response to the pandemic and the wide sweeping deratio storm. This grant opportunity allowed food banks and pantries to purchase refrigerators and freezers so they could take in more produce, meat, milk, cheese, providing individuals and families with a greater variety of healthy, fresh food while reducing food waste. And the next slide, please. SWAP funds are also used to conduct studies to help identify efforts for meeting waste reduction goals, to improve program efficiencies, and to strengthen economic efforts. This year, DNR plans to conduct its fifth statewide characterization study. The results of this study will be used, and we'll see in the next slide, in rethinking Iowa's current approach and potentially shifting towards a sustainable materials management approach. The state is in its second phase of Vision for Iowa, a stakeholder-driven process of identifying strategies to possibly transition Iowa's focus from managing material at the end of its useful life to using and reusing material more efficiently throughout its entire life cycle. Next slide, please. In summary, tonnage fees are collected for every ton of municipal solid waste landfilled in Iowa, according to a diversion rate calculation that incentivizes waste reduction and environmental efforts. These fees provide critical funding for environmental initiatives and measurable waste reduction with real financial savings to Iowa's communities and businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laurie. 
All right, let's move on to Wendy Worley in North Carolina. Um, Wendy is the section chief of the recycling and materials management section at the Department of Environmental Quality. And in this role, she leads the state's recycling section overseeing non-regulatory assistance programs for local governments and recycling businesses. And uh, she's got more than 28 years of experience in recycling and solid waste management and 18 of those have been with state government. So welcome, Wendy, the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Brenda, and thank you for having me. Um, thank you for everyone who's joining in the audience here today. Um, want to share with you a little bit um, about North Carolina's story, which you'll see um, uh, might be a little bit different from um, the experiences of some of the other states that we're hearing from, but certainly want to share with you our experience um, with disposal surcharges and the funding of recycling infrastructure. Next slide, please. You know, very much like Wisconsin and other states um, across the U.S., um, back in the late 80s and early 90s, North Carolina um, established through legislation um, a, a real strong solid waste management and recycling um, uh, policies statewide. Um, it was part of a national effort, I think, um, in response to um, environmental conditions and um, a growing concern over waste generation and how we manage that waste. Um, so in 1989, um, North Carolina passed a landmark legislation, Senate Bill 111, that was later codified into um, Section 1, 130A-309 of our code. Um, and th that really established the foundation for North Carolina's um, uh, responsibilities and the Department of Environmental Quality's duties to promote and assist the development of waste reduction and recycling programs all across the state. Um, another important piece of that legislation, not only in setting up um, the solid waste management hierarchy um, and um, some key disposal bans, as we heard from what Wisconsin, um, it also established for North Carolina what was called the Solid Waste Management Trust Fund. And that was um, a real pivotal piece of North Carolina's policy and legislation that, that directed the Department of Environmental Quality to provide technical assistance and financial assistance for the support of local government recycling programs and recycling market development. Um, so that was a real key piece of um, the legislation. And early funding sources of the Solid Waste Management Trust Fund um, included um, a portion of advanced disposal fees for banned items like white goods and tires and other, other smaller um, items. Um, but that was our er early funding sources. Next slide. And that allowed North Carolina to really establish um, itself as a grant maker around recycling um, infrastructure development and waste diversion. Um, our first grant was awarded in 1990. And over the years, we've really matured those programs into two primary funding cycles. Um, one, of course, um, as directed, we provide grants to local governments to support their recycling and waste diversion activities. Um, but it also allowed us to create um, a, a really strong structure for private recycling business development. Um, so really that jobs development, that recycling infrastructure development on the private side of um, was a real key piece of that um, foundational um, legislation that was passed in 89. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the funding levels, um, but did want to um, share that in, in its peak of grant making um, through the state of North Carolina, we had um, almost $3 million, um, and that was back in uh, the fiscal year 2013-14. Um, on average, we award between 35 and 80. I know that sounds like a big range, but it depends on the year, um, public and private projects uh, through our grant making. Um, and, you know, average uh, grant awards range from um, around $30,000 to uh, as much as $60,000 as a maximum award. We have allowed other special projects to um, uh, have a higher max um, grant award, but 
the, the goal with setting those max awards um, at those levels is to be able to provide um, uh, strategic funding throughout the state and to provide multiple um, projects to really spread that money and use it as effectively as possible. And part of that accountability and being effective is requiring a match um, by the grantee, both on the public and private side. Um, on the private side, we do have a little bit higher um, matching requirement of 50% of the grant, grant award um, is required by the private industries um, that we award grants to. Um, on the local side, we um, allow 20% uh, um, matching funds. So in addition, we have all of our grant cycles are run through on a competitive request for proposal cycle. Um, so that allows us to really um, uh, be uh, judicious in the awarding of our grant projects and our grant funding. Um, in addition to maintain a strong level of accountability, we require um, our grants to be distributed on a reimbursement basis only. Um, so only once the um, grantee has made the purchase um, then um, and submits those receipts, then we make um, those awards. In addition, we hold out 10% of that final funding um, before um, uh, allowing the grantee to receive that money, they, they must submit a uh, final report to our staff. That allows us to have a lot of data um, uh, that really helps um, justify the program. It allows us to make sure that um, there are key metrics um, being met as well as um, to allow us to um, uh, learn lessons and share those lessons out um, amongst others. Next slide. In addition, um, in 2008 uh, began um, the implementation of North Carolina's solid waste disposal tax. So um, in Senate Bill 1492 created in 2007, um, it was later implemented um, that following July 1st um, to collect its first um, uh, tax on our solid waste disposal. So in North Carolina, that is a $2 per ton uh, charge on every um, ton of waste disposed either in municipal solid waste landfills or in C&D um, landfills. In addition, it uh, charges that $2 per ton fee for any um, waste that is transferred out of state for disposal. So we do um, uh, capture the waste that is leaving our state in addition to the disposed tons in North Carolina. And our, our original allocation of those funds were 50% um, going to inactive hazardous waste um, or hazardous sites cleanups. And um, another way to think of that, um, it's sometimes called pre-regulatory landfills. Um, so these are the um, pre-regulatory um, uh, um, dumps that, um, for lack of a better word, that were scattered across the state and probably the nation. Um, but to, to clean up those old sites as they're recovered, 50% um, of that um, uh, tip fee um, collected goes to the cleanup of those sites. Um, 35, 37.5% um, goes directly to city and county solid waste management programs, and that's distributed on a per capita basis. Um, and then 12.5% of that was allocated directly to the Solid Waste Management Trust Fund for recycling grant making. Um, this was the, the original allocation of funds, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Next slide. Um, this just gives you a graphic indication of how those um, disposal tax funds were just are, are currently distributed. And then um, that orange piece of the pie, we'll talk about how that's changed over time. But again, um, a, a good portion of the um, solid waste disposal tax does go directly to local governments, cities, um, and counties throughout the state. Um, the one criteria um, for that piece is that local governments um, to be eligible for that funding must actually operate um, and provide solid waste or recycling services to their communities. Um, most do in North Carolina, but there are some that just leave that to the private industry. And so um, those small number of um, municipalities throughout the state um, do not are not eligible for this distribution. 
Um, one other piece I should say is that there is um, allowed via the legislation, just a small administrative tax that it, um, and that fee is capped at $225,000 per year. It is withheld by um, the Department of Revenue who collects um, this tax on behalf of, of the state. Um, next slide. Um, in 2013 um, was when um, the, our grant making authority kind of changed. So um, with that legislation that was passed, the legislature then redirected that 12.5% um, of the disposal tax to um, uh, the general fund instead of um, for our grant making uh, authority. The one positive piece of that legislation, even though it took away the solid waste management tr trust fund, um, it did maintain the department's grant making authority function as before. So um, again, you'll see that, you know, the our directive to provide technical and financial assistance, both to local governments and for market development was maintained. And um, I, I am proud to say, even though we are at a smaller funding level, since 2013, the General Assembly has continued to allocate funds through their budget bills um, at, at $1.1 million annually for this purpose. Next slide. Wendy, 30 more seconds. Yep. Um, so um, just wanna stress that there's a broad mandate um, allowing some flexibility. Um, that's, that's really been key to our programs. Next slide. And to allow this targeted recycling um, grant programs, not only do we have our, you know, the broad nature of our directive allows us to um, prioritize within our grant programs, but also to target some specific grant programs. And here's just a smattering of um, the specific grant target um, programs that we've allowed over the years. So we can talk more about those in the Q&A. And final slide. Um, and as part of this exercise, since we are one of those few states who had a, um, a disposal tax and then um, that was um, then redirected by the General Assembly to the General Fund, I did a little calculations that I don't allow myself to do much, but um, it just looks at how much um, money um, was lost through that effort. So um, this shows the total revenue that's been collected over the last three years by the disposal tax, um, through the disposal tax revenue, how much is net, um, was dedicated to the general fund that would have come into the solid waste management fund. And that last column um, on the right-hand side just shows you um, the, that amount that would have gone into the trust fund um, less the $1.1 million that's been allocated. So as you can see, we have really, um, uh, more than half of our grant making um, strength has been um, redirected to the general fund um, to sort of um, uh, allow us to um, you know, maintain our grant programs, but um, at a reduced funding level. Thanks, Wendy. That uh, speaks to underscores, I think Sophia's point at the beginning about tip is trying to protect your grant your grant program and your funding from being raided by the general fund all right so our last presenter today thanks for waiting marie is marie barnett with the ohio environmental protection agency she's the grants administrator with the division of environmental and financial assistance in the recycling and sustainability unit and she's been the grants administration administrator for the recycle ohio grant program since uh, 2015 and in that role, she and the other colleagues in her unit are awarding $4 million a year in funding to support not only recycling, but also litter prevention efforts in the state. And she's been with Ohio EPA for 25 years. So Marie, thanks for joining us today. The mic is yours. Thank you all so much. Good afternoon and thank you for having us. Um, as today, we're, I'll be talking today about Ohio EPA's Recycle Ohio Grant Program and the disposal fees. Next slide, please. Like other states here today, here's a quick snapshot of the material we will cover. Ohio waste disposal fees, our grant program, the impact of our grant program, and examples of our funding at work, and then share some tips for a successful grant program. Next, please. Ohio waste fees. 
The state, the state disposal fee of $4.75 a ton of solid waste collected at transfer facilities and landfills whenever waste, wherever waste is first accepted. These funds are used to administer environmental regu regulatory programs, solid waste fees and district fees, disposal fees of am amounts depend upon the origin of the waste, generation fee, no set amount, with planning fees of less than 50 cents a ton per solid waste. These funds are used to implement solid waste management plans. Host community fees, less than 25% a ton of solid waste, are collected at landfills, levied by cities and townships for costs incurred from hosting a landfill or road improvement. We also have construction and demolition debris fees, $1.60 a ton or 80 cents per cubic yard, used to administer environmental regulatory programs, funding recycling and litter prevention grants. We also have a scrap tire fee, $1 per new tire sold, used to administer in environmental regulatory programs and scrap, dire, scrap tire dump remediation. And this also funds the scrap tire grants. The recycling program was formed in 1980 and was originated at the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and moved to Ohio EPA in 2012. The intent of the program was to support Ohio communities by funding community-related litter prevention cleanups and activities, consisting of multiple funding source, 60 cents per ton disposal fee of construction and demolition debris, and 50, and 50 cents on fees of new tire purchases. Next slide, please. These fees support communities, nonprofits, business, and academic institutions through four grant types by funding project, projects such as recycling infrastructure, where you can be awarded up to $200,000, litter cleanup and tire amnesty events, up to $40,000, outreach and education, up to $50,000, and scrap tire processing and civil engineering projects, up to $300,000. And we also have litter surveillance cameras for up to $25,000. Next slide, please. To give you an example of these activities, our next slide from 2018 highlights a brief glimpse of our funding efforts at work. For example, communities reported collecting 11,966 bags of litter, 108,376 tires, and over 23 hours of community service, just to name a few. Next slide, please. And to show a couple examples, in Knox County, they held their annual Cocosing River cleanup. They cleaned up 23 river miles. The funds they received cover supplies and disposal fees, had hundreds of volunteers, and nearly 30 community partners. Ohio University was an additional grant. They funded an organics waste collection processing and diversion. We purchased new bins, collection carts, truck, and a conveyor diverted more than 112 tons of food waste in 2020. Next slide, please. We also funded American Paint Recyclers, expanded their latex paint recycling operation by purchasing a forklift, mixer, and filtration system. And lastly, Stark Tuscarawas Rain Recycling District. We dropped off recycling contamination reduction project, new recycling bin labels and signage, cameras to deter, to deter dumping at recycling sites, and contamination rates dropped from almost 65% to between 15 and 5%. Next slide, please. A few tips for why we believe our program is successful. Promote program and successful projects. Stay connected with the stakeholders and recycling and litter prevention trends. Projects must align with the strategic goals of the solid waste management plans and projects have a positive regional or statewide economic and environmental impact. Grant administrative assistance and oversight is important. No outstanding financial compliance issues with the applicant and financial requirements and safeguards when funding private businesses. And lastly, if you, I, I know we went through this pretty quickly. You can find us at recycle.ohio.gov or reach out to me and Marie Barnett at ohioepa.ohio.gov. I also have on with me today, Dave Folks and Ernie Stahl of the environmental, they are both environmental specialist threes with Ohio EPA and are here to answer any questions that you may have. 
Thanks, Marie. And we're very happy to have Ernie and uh, Dave folks with us today to join the panel. So let's, for the next 25 minutes or so, all the panelists can turn your videos on and uh, stay muted until you're talking just to preserve our sound quality. And um, let me start. I'm going to do a lightning round. I don't think we've tried this before, so bear with me as we see if this works again. A lightning round, and I'll call on you. Um, I'm going to go in the order in which we started. So, Larry, I'm going to start with you, um, and then Jennifer, Lori, Wendy, Marie, David, or Ernie, and then go back reverse way. So, lightning round. This means it's quick. No long answers. It's yes, no, it's complicated, it depends, but don't try to answer the question, all right? So some of these may be no-brainers. Some of them you may not be able to answer, state representatives, we understand. Um, did the surcharge face initial opposition? Uh, Larry? Yes. Okay. Um, Jennifer? Not really, no. No. Okay, let's see if I can get this right. Lori? <laughs> Not sure. It was a long time ago. Okay. Wendy. There was debate, but no opposition. Okay. And then Ohio. Ernie, I think you may be the best one. I'm not sure because you, the, I think the surcharge is in your um, wheelhouse, but, but David or Marie, if you want to answer, fine. Did the surcharge face initial opposition? It was a long time ago, so I can't say, but it hasn't in recent years. Okay, because that was my next question, to, and you already answered it. Has that opposition now essentially disappeared if there was opposition? And I think, Wendy, that might have been you. Has, for any of you who said that there was opposition, is it still there? Again, lightning strike. Um, no. No. Any other comments from any of you about opposition? Larry? Certain, certain parts of the fee. Certain parts, which parts, Larry? The 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 fees that don't go to uh, clean up. There's still some opposition on those. Don't yeah. go to recycling. Yeah, you know, I was going to ask about that because you know some of my takeaways as I've been taking notes is that you know, and I think Pennsylvania is a great example of that. Is that the that the fee or the grants don't all go to waste related projects. And so in Pennsylvania, there's the environmental stewardship. You gave some great examples about mine reclamation, more flexibility with those. Is that is is that part of the grant program, having that flexibility? How important and I and one of the things I really appreciated, Larry, that you said was don't um, don't just look at recycling rates, look at the economic impacts of these programs to your state, look at the environmental impacts. So having it go to environmental stewardship program, is there a connection with these other environmental stewardship projects? How important is that to your state? Well, de dealing with our environmental problems is is huge portion. That's why there was so much of a support from the grassroots to get that law passed. The, the industry felt like they shouldn't be paying or be impacted for the the ills of the mining industry per se. So there, there's always that rub there as to who's paying for it. Certainly we've all benefited as Pennsylvanians from the recycling program and growing greener. Yeah. Um, has your, and this is back to the lightning round, has your grant program led to new infrastructure for diverting waste from disposal? So, um, Dave, David, I see you nodding. So let's just start with you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Wendy. Yes, absolutely. That is the thing that we fund. We only fund infrastructure. Um, we do not pay for salaries or anything else. So absolutely. Yes. Lori. Yes. Jennifer. It's complicated. <laughs> Okay. Uh, um, okay. So we already got Ohio. Jennifer, do you want to expound on that? I'm going to, on why it's complicated about creating new infrastructure. Sure. I mean, I'm sure that we have, but as I mentioned in my remarks, you know, we don't fund infrastructure grants per se, you know, it's a depreciated level. So I'm sure, you know, as a community has received grants over 20 years, we paid for, you know, their building or their truck or something to that effect, but it's a little bit different in, in our structure, you know, as Wendy said, you know, they don't pay salaries, we do, you know, so it's a little bit different. Okay. One of the pushbacks I've heard from in some of the states that were working to replicate this is, 
oh, you're raising the tip fees on disposal, that's going to lead to illegal dumping. So lightning round again, has the surcharge led to any increase? I shouldn't say any increase. Has it led to problems with illegal dumping? So Jennifer, let's start with you and go back around the other way. No. No. Okay. Lori. I'd say no. No. Good. Wendy? No. Um, Larry, I think I skipped you. So Larry. No. All right. Um, David. No. no All right. No, no. One of the things I noticed, and David, maybe, or Marie, with the grant program, you might want to say a word about this, but one of the things we've noticed that, that the grants go to combating littering and illegal dumping. So whether it's, you know, collecting tires or creating, you know, places for the materials to go instead of landfill. Um, any, of you, any of you, this is now free, any of you want to comment on how important those grants are to actually, instead of leading to increases in dumping, have actually led to helping to combat and do litter prevention? Any, any thoughts? I can think of a couple grants that we've given out where uh, a local community has bought, you know, a trailer supplies and, and they're, they're recruiting volunteers within their local area and doing regular cleanups, um, you know, with, with the supplies and equipment that they're offering. David? From a Ohio perspective, the, the program has been helping support litter prevention and outreach since like 1981. So sometimes you, you know, the pessimists and you think like, why are people still lit littering? <laughs> you know, but then there's still a need, but we, we know that, you know, that funding isn't always available at the local community level. You know, there's not like allocated funding for that. So we, we know it has an impact. We hear that kind of, you know, from our, our grantees, you know, when, when they close out and we hear the success stories, a lot of times we even hear it through third parties, you know, that it's helped when, when we hear that through an Ohio would be a funded project, you know, the, so to us, the key is maybe not pound removed. It's the um, it's the involvement you pull in from the community members and the stakeholders, and and that you know how that education spreads and, and the commitment to the local level. So, good. Um, one of the things that came up is this notion that as you succeed in diverting building infrastructure, diverting programs, um, creating recycling infrastructure, and alternatives to disposal, then you. Um, have less tonnage flowing to landfills. I think, Laura, you, I forget who was the exception showing more waste going, but, um, but, you know, you can run into a problem where, I don't know if it's a problem, but you have less dollars in your fund because you have shrinking tonnage as you become more successful. So my question is, is there a need, would you say as part of a, a tip or lesson learned, is there a need to review or increase the surcharge to account for shrinking waste disposal? And I think Larry, you were the one who mentioned the consumer price index. So the value of a $2 per ton fee in late 1980s is you know, a fraction of what it is worth today. So that's not lightning round. Anybody wanna, I see Wendy, you're nodding on that. So maybe I'll just start with you. What do you think? Uh yeah, I, I was mainly reacting to the inflationary, um, you know, aspects of it. Um, you know, when our disposal tax was implemented, it was two dollars per ton. That clearly is, um, you know, not the same value as, um, you know, when it was passed um, as it is today. So, you know, if North Carolina were to re-implement something um, or increase that, um, that um, charge, I think that would be valuable um, to the state. Um, related to, um, you know, the other piece, um, I think that, um, you know, North Carolina really could, you know, utilize um, that funding um, in a lot of ways if it were re-implemented back into um, the Solid Waste Management Trust Fund or some other named fund um, for grant making purposes. Um, and, uh, you know, that I think could be very valuable. Do any of you in states where you review the, the fees range widely and as Sophia indicated as well. And Sophia, you should feel free to um, show your video. I forgot to call you out. You might wanna weigh in on some of these questions, um, but um, the fees range widely. So some are really low. She, I think Sophia, you presented Indiana, I think it was under you know, about 50 cents or under a ton. And some of you are closer to $12 a ton, but, um, you know, is there a need to review 
the fees or work that into policy? I have one real quick comment and then um, I certainly want to give the floor to the, the panel or, um, but, um, you know, related to, um, you know, needing to reestablish that, you know, or its impact on, 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 on the other um, aspects of grant making, I, I think that is um, definitely something that is implemented um, that should be re-looked re at. Um, and I don't think, um, especially at a $2 per ton rate, um, you know, I don't think there's a, a, a large fear in um, uh, uh, creating so much infrastructure immediately um, that would then um, degrade your funding mechanism. I think that we have a long way to go in the United States before we ever reach that piece. Um, so I think there's, um, while we certainly do want to implement some timing, um, you know, it's it's a long way to go before we we really uh, need to be too concerned with that. There's a lot of waste still out there. Anybody else want to comment? Otherwise, I'll David, go ahead. Yeah, I would agree that the diversion rate is still low enough that if you're leaning on fees, you know, to help pay for a recycling program or creating recycling infrastructure, where most most states aren't at that point where they feel the need to change that structure. And just being an optimist, if it got to that point, I think that'd be a good problem to have. Kind of like we talk about pollution prevention. If you joke, you work your way out of a job, right? If you reduce all the pollution. And at that point, you know, we cross that bridge or, or that problem. And at that point, recycling also, there's more value in it. So maybe you don't need to kind of supplement it, right? And help help it because it's kind of, it's, it's a different business model. It's It's more, economically beneficial to recycle versus send it to a landfill. So. Yeah, let me ask, I'm going to backtrack a little bit and just ask about how the fee is applied. Um, I can't remember, sorry, which one of you said it's just on municipal solid waste and not on construction lemon construction demolition debris, because a lot of those landfills don't have scales. And I think other of you said it's, you know, on all solid waste. So um, let me just go through which of you know how any of you can comment on how you how you assess the fees when there's no scale if you are doing other types of solid waste in facilities that don't have scale and i think larry maybe you might this might apply to you shake your head no if not because i think you indicated you had what half a dozen staff out in the field you know helping to collect the fees so maybe this is you can elaborate here well, they, they don't collect the fees. They're dedicated okay. specifically implementing a recycling program. And okay. you cannot operate a disposal facility or a processing facility in the Commonwealth without scales. Okay. So are any of you in states where you're assessing the fee on, on sites that don't have scales and have to do like conversion? No? In Ohio, the only facilities that would do that are construction and demolition debris disposal facilities. Okay, and Ernie, does the the fee applies to C and D? And then, how does that do they they have to convert by volume or do estimates? So the fee only applies to construction and demolition debris. There, the law says that it's one amount per ton, and then it's basically another ton amount for cubic yards. So they don't have to convert; it's automatically give it to them in those amounts. Okay, good. All right. Um, so I'm. Um, let me just ask um, so many questions we have. Um, Can I go back on one of your questions? Yeah. Yes, please. So with regards to infrastructure and the, the cost of the fee, one of the things that become glaring to us is the need to re invest in processing infrastructure in the Commonwealth. We are a state of approximately 13 million people, and we have approximately, depending on how you define them, 13 to 18 single stream facilities which is resulting in increased costs because a limit in competition. You know, prior we had many of the source separated dual stream facilities operating and they're going away because of our inability to invest in publicly run facilities. So that's definitely an issue with us with regards to our ability to spend that I thought the group should hear. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do any of you have on, on actually other states developing either new rules or passing bills. So any recommendations regarding two questions here is how to protect the funds from being raided by the general fund is one. And then if you have any advice on whether 
the implementation should be by rules or by statute. And I, I think, you know, Larry, when you first started, there were parts of it that were by statute, which, you know, really delineated things and other parts that gave more flexibility. So do you have any, start with you again, Larry, if we do quick answers, we'll get to more questions, but I know it's tough. <laughs> I, I guess I would say with, with having specific rules and regulations on the expenditures of your recycling program, it helps keep it in line and protects you from legislative pressure to fund projects that you normally would not prioritize. So I'm a proponent when it comes to recycling infrastructure to have rules and some really good guidelines. Thank you. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Jennifer, I see you nodding. Yeah, um, our grant distribution method is prescribed in statute, and that is a challenge in Wisconsin. It is antiquated, and um, it's our distribution amounts are literally based on 1999 factors um, because of line item veto that was implemented at that time when they tried to change the formula. So here we, we have a not a good example of how to distribute our recycling grant because it's um, based in statute, we don't have a method to modify that. Yeah, and actually that was one of the important points I was hoping to make in my presentation is that um, having that really broad language um, that gives us the charge to make these grants um, has really been extremely effective, I think. Um, in my view, it's really allowed our staff to be responsive to the marketplace and the needs and the infrastructure um, that um, our communities are really telling us that they, they have. Um, so it's allowed us to prioritize certain types of projects within our two main grant rounds, the public and private grant rounds, but also has allowed us to carve out portions of that uh, funding um, to force really specific targeted projects. And that was sort of the list on my slide that sort of allowed us to do that. The, tra the transition from bins to carts, for example, um, a number of years ago um, to collect more materials, um, convenience center um, uh, upgrades, um, you know, COVID-19 grants we were able to award. Um, there, the list goes on, um, but that um, was only allowed uh, because our charge via the legislation was so broad and just gives us um, the, the broad goal. And then we go out there and decide how to implement. Thank you. So how, how do you protect funds from being raided by state agencies? So um, Larry, I know in Pennsylvania, you faced face this issue over many years, right? And Wendy, you showed some slides on this. So Wendy, do you want to, I don't oh. know, maybe Maybe well, we should I ask guess, the other states. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, somebody needs to tell me clearly. Uh, <laughs> now, um, the only thing that I can really think to protect it is that in the legislation um, to very clearly um, define why that piece of funding. So, and as you saw on our slide, only 12 and a half percent of the disposal fee was supposed to be going to recycling grant making. Um, and even that that loss was gobbled up by the trust fund. Um, I mean, it eliminated the trust fund and gobbled up by the general fund. Um, so I would say, you know, try to get in that legislation as strongly um, linked as possible to um, the purpose. Um, but clearly that wasn't, a, um, you know, able to save us. So I, I welcome others idea. David? Uh, do you want me to take it, Dave? Oh. So our, our fees are all established in law and all of the laws say that they get deposited in special fund for that purpose. The law also specifies the amounts of each, each funding source that go to grants. So it's all in law, but you know that the General Assembly can make up their mind to do something with a law and say, we're gonna take this part. But so far it hasn't happened in my knowledge. And Sophia, I just wanna bring you into the conversation. Is there, Anything in your research, I think this is one of your key findings um, in the research you, you, you did about it, trying to protect it. Anything you wanna weigh in here on how to protect funds from being raided? I just heard from most states and counties that I talked to that they would have liked to have something um, from the get-go that protected their funds um, as opposed to 
you know, trying to deal with fallout of the fund being raided later on. All right. Well, Brenda, I could add to that too from the yes, Wisconsin please. experience. Sure. Um, we have had our own, you know, raids. Um, we used to have something called the segregated recycling fund where the funds were deposited in. And, you know, as Ernie mentioned, the legislature can change that and, and did. And then they called it an economic development fund and it was the same funding source. So I, I don't have a solution to that. Um, but I guess one thing that we've been looking at Wisconsin related to transportation is apparently we would have the ability via changing our Wisconsin constitution to literally designate segregated funds for those purposes only um, would not be subject to raids, um, but we have not actually been successful in passing a constitutional uh, amendment as of yet. Yeah, that's a good point. And I noticed that um, Will Sager, my colleague from the Southeast Recycling Development Council, posted a note as well that Georgia was able to successfully add that to a constitutional amendment um, back in 2020. So, um, you know, definitely something to look at and something that could have possibly prevented um, our fund from being raided. So, um, you know, certainly a mechanism we will look into. One other issue that came up is this notion of competitive versus non-competitive grants. And I think Lori, you know, with responsible units, you know, all it's all non-competitive. And I think Wendy, you said it's all competitive. So, and then Ohio um, and, and Wisconsin, Jennifer, you know, is, and Larry, I think there's a mix. So I'd love to just, kind of parse this out for I want to ask one more closing question before we end in four minutes so um, do you like the mix of competitive and non-competitive I guess would you recommend that going forward Jennifer let's start with you and then I want to go to Ohio who wants to answer and then right, I'll make this quick um, Wisconsin was actually one that isn't a mix we are strictly oh. non-competitive so everyone gets a slice of the pie so um, there are disadvantages to that I will say I mean, advantages and disadvantages, clearly, you know. <laughs> so Marie and David on the grant program. And I'll say really quick, and Marie might add something because, you know, she, she's like our, our grant administrator, but that the, there are, they are competitive, but kind of competitive is different kind of based on a project. So like a community grant for like litter cleanup or garden recycling, we, we don't look at necessarily just like how much material they're moving or diverting. It, it's it's a holistic approach to their application, right? There's a there's a, a big key to all theme to all our grants is readiness, and re readiness can mean a lot of things. It could be you know, are you ready to actually do this litter cleanup event, or host this activity, or start recycling? And sometimes a small community might still do well because they have all their ducks in a row per se, right? The contracts in place, and they they have a plan, and they know where they're going to divert material. So just because it's competitive doesn't mean that like not everybody can't do well. Yes, right. We've had a, a variety of, you know, or organizations get funded. Good. All right. So let me ask my last question. And if you guys can keep it each under a minute, we'll be good. Um, if you had a magic wand and could change, I was going to say two things, but because of time, I'm going to say one thing about your program. <laughs> what would it be? So, Larry, let me just start. Let me start with you and we'll go in order of how you present it. So if you could change one thing about your program what would it be i would increase the amount of revenue we had to support infrastructure in pennsylvania that's our biggest problem and our number one need to have competition within the processing arena Good. perfect jennifer wish list item if we could increase our recycling funding and distribute more grant funds laurie well i think uh, a big part of our program is that we uh we measure waste diversion through a formula and it would, I think it'd be great, you know, if, if you are really going to use something as an incentive to be able to actually measure it rather than, than try to devise a formula that, uh, you know, it does have some advantages for some and maybe not advantages for, for others. Wendy. Well, my obvious answer is to redirect that 12.5% um, of our disposal fee right back into um, our grant making fund. So that would be number one. Um, if I squeeze in a number two, I would say increase that fee beyond $2 is not enough. David, we'll start with you and Marie and Ernie. If you want to add your own magic yeah. wand wish list, feel free. <laughs> well, I know 
Marie and I usually talk kind of about the same thing because we, we talk about the ARP grant program a lot. The joke is with our spending authority, you know, that's how much you have permission to go to a bank and take out. And um, so it would, would, would be nice to, you know, to maybe have higher spending authority in some years for projects that come in that are all really good projects. And, you know, you're still, you still have to make decisions based on the technical review process and what you recommend to our director who makes the decision. So that's the easy answer. Yes, like more, more spending authority to have a greater impact with the, you know, fees that fund our, our grant programs. Thank you all. And we will, I want to, we're right at time. So thank you all for participating today. I wish we could have given you all a lot more time as you all deserved. And I feel like we just scratched the surface on your program. So Sophia has written each of your programs up. We put the links in the chat. We'll send them out again. And a survey is going to pop up for you attendees. Um, and so please take the time to fill it out. That'll improve our programming in the future. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, again, thank you to all of our panelists and all of you for staying right to the end. Have a good day.